thank you all so much for joining us today. We wanted again, of course, also to thank Norman Foster for the amazing conversation we had uh, a few weeks ago as part of this series. And uh, we discussed a lot, of course, with Norman, the future of cities, uh, what it means uh, to live together. Uh, we spoke also about this book of uh, Roland Barthes, which is a book I wanted to recommend to you all. It's an extraordinary book to read uh, at this very moment in time. Roland Barthes, it's a, actually a seminar uh, he gave towards the end of his life, and it's basically uh, about different ways of living together. It's uh, very much an idea, he calls it idiorhythmy, a productive form of living together, which uh, recognizes and respects the individual rhythms of the other. And it could not be a more timely book for this current moment in time where it's so important, you know, how are we going to live together in the future? So that will be a theme, of course, today in the conversation with Sumaya. We are so delighted, Sumaya, to have you with us uh, today. You, Sarah de Villiers, and Amina Kaska founded Counterspace, uh, the amazing practice in Johannesburg. We're going to talk about, about Counterspace, about the way you uh, work with architecture and urbanism, and of course, also ecology. Mike Bloomberg wrote this uh, wonderful book with Carl Pope called Climate of Hope. And I think this idea of climate of hope very much summarizes your, your practice. So to Maya, a very warm welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mike and Bettina as well for the generous introduction. And Hans Ulrich, it's so wonderful to see you again. I can't wait to be in London and working with you. Um, you know, in real space, but I'm really enjoying the time we have now as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I wanted to begin with the beginning because I, I wanted to ask you how it all began, how, how you came to architecture or how architecture came to you. Was there a sudden awakening or an epiphany or was it a more gradual process? And how did you then come from you going into architecture to this collaborative practice of counter space? I think for me, it was quite a gradual process how I came to architecture. Um, I was born in an apartheid township in South Africa called Lodium in Pretoria. And I spent much of my childhood in inner city Johannesburg. And I consider myself really lucky that I got to experience the city from a really young age. Um, I was born when apartheid started to fall. So I also really like this theme that you're describing, a climate of hope because I was born in, an, in a time of immense social justice issues and immense challenges, but also, you know, with a firm belief that we can create worlds where people can come together. And um, I was just, I, over the years, I've just been deeply, deeply inspired by Johannesburg, by its real fastness, its roughness, its grittiness, um, but also in the immense sense of hope that it has. We have a really amazing city, um, that is so full of vibrancy and so full of life, despite all of its challenges. And um, I also felt that architecture was not really responding to our conditions, that we had typologies and forms that we inherited from elsewhere, and that architecture wasn't really engaging with the true richness of the city, almost like a particle collider of the richness of the rest of the African continent. So I felt very deeply this urge in me that I wanted to create a world that was truly engaging with, with the context and with the city. Now we had a long conversation the other day for the catalog uh, with David Adje, whom, as Bettina said, has played such a central role in this project, as he always does with everything we do at the Southern Time with Architecture and with Natalia Gabowska, our curator. And we, I wanted to, um, uh, to come back actually to that conversation because mm -hmm. we discussed there a little bit how you function with counter space because it's a very unusual form of collaboration. David Adji was even wondering if it's more related to a musical band than to an architecture group. Can you tell us a little bit about these synergies and the way how the three of you collaborate? And of course, it's a much bigger collaborations because you engage with so many other practitioners with each single project. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think I've never been in a band, but I think it's a really good analogy. Um, it's, uh, you know, the set of creative forces that you, you share energy with and you share ideas with. And, um, you know, we also often influence each other just by osmosis in a way, just from being in the same space. Um, and I think that collaboration is absolutely essential to what we do. And like you're, like you're saying, it's also about collaborating with other disciplines and other practitioners 
and collaborating really with the city. Um, if I can think a little bit about how we uh, set up our working space and also um, you know, this digital world that we're moving into is, is, I'm thinking a lot more about how we collaborate in this realm as well. But this, the space that we set up in Johannesburg is in the inner city and it's with a group of other disciplines. So we work with artists, we work with um, uh, landscape architects, we work with exhibition designers, sometimes even musicians, researchers, sound composers, poets. Um, we also have a roving space that we offer to students and academics. And I think that that's very much about creating this energy of, of, of sharing ideas and sharing work and sharing skills. And then we also have another small space just up the road that we call Backstory. And that's a shop front space. And we use it to host events um, in Johannesburg and to, I call that a collaboration with the city, where we invite people to become a part of our discourse and a part of our dialogue about architecture. Um, I think now more than ever also, we need to really be thinking about how we learn from each other and how our disciplines can be a lot more generous with each other. Um, given the times that we're facing and the crisis that we're facing as well, I think it's really important that we all you know, come together creatively. And as Mike said in the, in the introduction, you know, we spoke in the last conversation, Ms. Norman, very much about also what's changing now in terms of social distancing and what that will mean for cities and, and for urbanism and what it means for, for living together. And of course, all about in this wonderful book, How to Live Together, talks about this idea that we can actually recognize and respect the individual rhythm of the other. And that's something which you've been doing a lot in, in your work because you've created a conversation room in 2019. You've also created spaces for gathering, for social gathering. Uh, you've created a mosque, which is actually interesting because of course David Adjay is also creating such a gathering space now in Ghana as we speak. He's gonna tell us about it actually uh, in a, a conversation soon. He's gonna be one of our next guests in, in June in this series. So I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about these, you know, many different community spaces and convening spaces, which have been somehow the core of your practice and how you create spaces for community and convening to bring, also to bring different communities together. And then maybe in the second part of the answer, it would be great if you tell us how that now changes and how you see the future of such convening and community spaces with the social distancing. Mm. Um, yeah, I think, so a lot of what I've been doing um, when I was working in London on the pavilion research is, is, is trying to be as present as possible in different communities. And I think that my work, so it's also like working collaboratively with other people and other disciplines. It's, it's about listening and about absorbing as much as one is able to from a place. And I think when working with a community, it's also about that. It's about... Um, allowing this dialogue between oneself and with the people that one is working with and with the place that one is working with as well. In a way, I think much of Johannesburg was not built like that. It was built, you know, with a very unidirectional approach um, that came from colonialism and apartheid, and it wasn't about a dialogue with the city. So for me, it's really important that any work that I do is um, about how I am shaped by the people that I work with as well and about ingesting as much as I can from a place and from its people and then interpreting and translating that into form. So that um, that is also how I've approached gathering spaces um, and how I approach designing spaces for community. I believe very much in looking at spaces that communities create for, for themselves for, for gathering and um, also, I think it's interesting to think about how that is um, or how people will approach gathering in, in, in times of crisis. I think that um, much of what I've observed in London in how people construct belonging when they're in a new situation, so how a migrant community starts to create spaces for praying together or eating together, almost you know in small intimate settings um, outside of a formal space outside of a, of a gathering community space and so on is very much what is happening now in Johannesburg so for example lots of people because we're all observing Ramadan now in my community 
are gathering to pray in small groups in, in people's homes and so on, in groups of two and three and not mixing households. And I think that um, maybe in the near future, we'll also see much more intimate gatherings. And I hope that we'll also um, develop more of an understanding of the sacredness of gathering. And that, of course, brings us, and that's maybe the last project I wanted to ask you about before we then talk about the pavilion, the Serpentine Pavilion as a two-year commission. But before that, I wanted to ask you, tell us about the Brixton Mosque in Joburg, which is your only proposition uh, for a building, actually. Mm -hmm. And as David Adger says, you know, an idea of the mosque is also the idea of hybridization of an old building. Uh, it's actually originally a Dutch Reformed church which uh, you basically transform. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how you do that and how you work on this very hybrid building of a Brixton Mosque in Joburg? I think um, in a way all my projects uh, deal with this hybridity in some way because I think that none of us um, have a pure singular identity. We're all uh, you know, conglomerates and mixtures of empire and of migration and of deep histories and deep futures as well. And I, I believe very much in thinking through how architecture can express this mutation and this hybridization and that you can, you know, always striving for how we can recognize each other in, in architectural terms as well. So um, my approach to the Brixton mosque design was really to respect um, its heritage as a church building, but then also, you know, to, to occasionally blur the lines between faiths, between um, architectures. So, for example, there's a street facade that incorporates archways that draw on both geometries, Islamic and um, the previous Dutch Reformed Church. But then there are also moments where, you know, in the daytime, the building exists as its old church self. And during the prayer five times a day, um, a light beam shines up from the old clock tower. So it becomes a perform performative minaret in a sense. Um, and then apart from the street facade being animated with these arches, it's really quite a quiet presence during the daytime. But at night, that, uh, that set of archways is really lit up. So it takes on another presence. So in a way, it takes on a more Islamic presence, a more strongly Islamic presence, I guess. But in a way, the building is able to hold these multiple identities in one form. And I think that's also the approach that I tried to take with the pavilion as well, and in, in several of the other projects that I'm working on. Exactly. I mean, there could not be a better transition to the pavilion, the Serpentine Pavilion, because I remember when we invited you to the first site visit to London and we had a meeting with Bettina and also with uh, David Adje, uh, with Natalia, also with uh, Julie Bernal, with David Glover. We all gathered together, you know, and basically we're listening to your ideas for, for the pavilion. And I found the notes today from that meeting and you, mm -hmm. in that very first meeting, talked about superimposition, subtraction, splicing of architectural forms. And then the key idea really to combine and bring together many different peripheral communities uh, from London. Now, obviously mm -hmm. the pavilion is uh, for us such an important part of what we do at the Serpentine. And I think it's also important because it goes towards the people. There are no doors, there are no thresholds. It's, it's open itself for everyone. Uh, mm -hmm. So actually many people always tell us that they discover it by chance. They come to the park and all of a sudden, much more than this, you know, an exhibition where there is a door, they almost stumble on it or across it, or however one would say in English, and, and, you know, discover a new world. And it's interesting when we did the Arthur J. Fry exhibition at the Serpentine, we explained to Arthur that that's our principle, you know, it's art for all, it's free admission, it's generosity for, for more than a million people a year. And he said, that's not enough. He said, you need to go to lots of different neighborhoods because there are many neighborhoods around London where people will never come to central London. So for us, it was a really important point and that triggered this project in Barking Dagenham, where now uh, with uh, our civic curator, our Calaf and the teams, you know, we are, we are having artists in, in residence. We're working with Sonia Boyce and uh, Rory Pilgrim and others on a radio ballad series. We're having Susan Lacey from Los Angeles in residence and she's gonna work on a, on a whole future of the city analysis, also on an oral history a little bit like Stats Turkle, she's going to listen to many people in Barking Dagenham. And it was so fascinating because your idea was totally in sync with our Barking Dagenham initiative because you said exactly the same Arthur Jaffa said. You think 
the pavilion cannot just be a general statement in Kensington Garden. It needs to really connect all the neighborhoods across London. Can you tell us a little bit about this idea and how you practically actually are going to do this now, of course, even better with more time because we can do it now as a two year process. Absolutely. I was really super inspired by um, the Buckingham Dagenham project and I can't wait to hopefully collaborate on that as well as part of this project. Um, but I think when we when we received the invitation to make a submission, I was really, really taken by how important the commission is. And for me, it was really, really important that this moment becomes not just about me or about um, us as a collective, um, but really about how we can share the platform with London. And often my work is thinking deeply about how typologies can become more responsive and include um, you know, people, like you said, on the, per on the periphery or who are marginalized, because that's something that I'm confronted with in my context all the time, in a way the majority is marginalized. So we have to think about how I, our typologies can become more inclusive. And in a lot of my ways of working, I also draw on, on not just on making buildings, but on how we can construct scenarios and situations, how we can construct events and spaces for dialogue. And I see all of these as part of ways of making architecture. Um, and at the time I was reading Christina Sharp and she was writing about this idea of the wake. And one of her definitions of the wake was this idea of the procession. Um, and I became really inspired by this idea of these processions that could happen all over the city. And it really reminded me um, or made me think about an architecture that could be dispersed and could be located in many different places and that people could be, um, communities could be, um, you know, animating these spaces and that there could be some kind of a connection between all these places and the pavilion in Kensington Gardens. So um, how we're hoping it will work, but we're still planning this. And especially now that we have more time, we have more time, you know, for this engagement to become a lot deeper, is um, for us to work with all of these communities in neighborhoods across London, many of whom we've started to reach out to and also you know, that I've, I've been looking at and researching in the archives and in my interactions in the city in London. Um, but we're hoping that we will have fragments of the pavilion that will be located elsewhere and that will move to the pavilion to complete it um, over the course of its life. Um, but now that we have more time, we're also working on um, how else we can, can engage community. So we're thinking about that digitally, virtually, and in physical space as well. And of course, this will also involve rituals. And I want to talk a little bit more about rituals because I think particularly in moment of crisis, rituals are important. And I think we've all, you know, thought about rituals over the last two or three months a lot. And we've all, I think, come up with new rituals. We, we, did, not do, we did not do before. I've come up with a new ritual that every day on my, you know, daily walk in the park, I actually recall conversations with animals. It's become a, you know, a new series on, on TikTok. I think this idea, Tarkovsky really spoke about that. Tarkovsky, the, the film director said, we, we live in a world bereft of rituals and we need to kind of introduce new rituals. And I know that rituals are very close to your heart. You've written an extremely beautiful text called Golden Plateaus, which uh, whoever's interested in, one can uh, freely access it on eflux, e-flux, on eflux.com. Uh, and in this text, Golden Plateau, you talk about rituals and the importance of rituals. And in a way, rituals, I think, are particularly important now where we communicate so much digitally. So we have so much communication, but maybe less community. And rituals are kind of the opposite of that. Rituals are all about community, kind of without communication. It doesn't really need communication for rituals. So I was very curious if you can tell us a little bit about rituals in the age of smartphones and communication devices and what kind of rituals plays for you in your architecture and how you're going to bring us rituals to the serpentine and to your pavilion over the next you know 12 18 months absolutely i think um i completely agree with what you're saying about rituals and that they're important and also um from the text that we have to bring them back as well i think um that for me, rituals are about us um, creating identities for ourselves, asserting our, um, ourselves, and also about how we construct belonging for so many communities, especially. 
Um, and that's something that we've been looking at uh, with the Pavilion Commission and with how we're going to program these events. They're very much looking at community rituals. Even the forms in the Pavilion have been drawing on community rituals. So um, street gatherings, people sitting on the floor and eating, intimate one-to-one um, -one spaces, you know, spaces where teenagers hang out in, in these peripheral areas. Really drawing on these small moments of gathering is, is really important. And there's also um, things that architects can learn from. How, how, do, we, how do we provide for, for these rituals to happen? Um, in my daily life at the moment, I'm just trying to think about what you said about introducing new rituals. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in awe at the moment of how much of my own ritual of being is tied to being physically in the city. I really get so much of my energy from it and my inspiration and creativity also, I believe, comes from there. Um, but I have, I have been developing very internal rituals. I've been um, practicing a lot more mindfulness and meditation to, cre to create more space, hopefully, for imagination. And I've also been um, thinking a lot about sound and its ability to transport us to different places and, you know, to connect us to different people as well. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, thank I don't you. Know. And, and sound brings us uh, to a wonderful work you have created. Actually, a digital work you have created for the Serpentine as part of our Do It project. The Do It project is basically a project of instructions. It's a show we started with Christian Boltanski and Bertrand Lavier in 1993, 27 years ago, this idea of an exhibition uh, with instructions, recipes, uh, do it yourself pieces. So people could just do it. And so we did many different versions. It happened in about 160 cities. Lots of books came out. And then we somehow forgot about it and moved on. And something really fascinating happened because when the lockdown happened first in China in mm -hmm. uh, January and February, uh, we got a lot of WeChat alerts that people had revisited these do it books and these do it instructions. And during the lockdown started to do these do it yourself pieces by, by artists. And these, of course, also got to do with the fact that we need projects which get, away, get us away from the screen, no? because it all happens in two dimensions. We are all now on Zoom every day, mm -hmm. on team meetings every day, nonstop. And, uh, and, and in a way, the Do It project has to do with actually getting the instruction online, but then doing something physically. And some, some are recipes, some are actually instructions of what one can do for someone else. How can one help someone else, which is so important in this current moment of of precarity and at the same time some instructions are also about interacting with other people of course with a distance so louise bourgeois uh, she made one of the first instructions for this project in the 90s she gives instructions to every day smile at a stranger now of course from a distance so lots of different instructions and you did a wonderful piece which has been published on the serpentine uh, instagram which is an instruction piece everybody can do it uh, and at the same time it also involves sound can you tell us a little bit about about this do it piece. Sure, um, I love the do it project as well. Um, I think it's also so important that we we use um, the virtual and digital for what it can give us and, and how it can connect us, but also that the sacredness of being present and being in space is really important. Um, and I've been thinking more and more about analog things and I think the do it feels very resonant and prescient as well. Um, the do it that I, so yes, it was inspired very much about this time that we're having and this crisis that we're going through. And it had me feeling really reflective about um, a generation that we might lose and about the knowledges and the stories that get lost with that generation as well. Again, this is something in my context that we grapple with all the time where our histories are continually being lost, being erased, um, you know, not even visible sometimes. Um, so my do it was an instruction to record a story, a song or a recipe in, or reach out to an old person first and then record a story, a song or a recipe in their mother tongue. Um, and I, I did the do it with um, two wonderful participants, an architect named Yasmin Lari from Pakistan, who is a dear friend and collaborator as well. Um, and Sana Swarpoy, who speaks um, the Khoi language, which is currently endangered in South Africa. And there are very few people who speak it. Um, but yeah, it's, I think it's very much about creating an archive of stories and also about honoring a generation um, 
which is very fragile at the moment. So we can maybe all now do this piece. We can just all record someone in the next couple of days and uh, uh, we can do it in any medium. It can also happen over the telephone, right? Absolutely, yes. Both of mine were on WhatsApp voice notes. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Uh, maybe one last question before we open it uh, up to all of your questions or comments uh, uh, and make it more polyphonic. I wanted to ask you about your reading. Uh, so I've been talking about Roland Barthes and my obsession for this book about how to live together, particularly in the current moment. So I was curious about your reading over the last couple of weeks during the lockdown. Are there any books you can recommend or texts? Yes, I've been reading um, Catherine Yusuf, A Billion Black Anthropocenes, um, Onan, and it's, it's a very, it's, it's really, really interesting also reflecting on not just crisis, but sustainability as well, and how related um, everything in our world is. So she really talks through um, empires and extraction and um, class and labor struggles and ecology and sustainability and how everything is really tied together. Um, and I'm finding it really, really resonant and interesting that we, we have to um, you know, think deeply and slowly about these things, but we have to respond urgently as well. That's a great book, um, Catherine Yusuf, A Billion Black Anthropocenes. And we've actually just this morning been discussing it with our Back to Earth team, because it's a book also which is very inspiring for the Serpentine project of our 50 ecological campaigns. So we've been speaking about it with Rebecca Lewin this morning. And Rebecca, you know, made me aware of the importance of the geology, you know, in this book of Katrin Yusuf, because yeah. uh, she writes that geology is never a formation only of materiality, but also of time and species and its thin race, explanation and future politics. Geologic relations are always material relations of power, relations that are constituted through their passage. And it's a passage of resistance, lines on a map. And the collections of mineral artifacts they enable have consequences. They establish unfolding geologies for particular bodies and subject positions as disposable in the shadow economy of extraction. That's the book on page 59. Can you talk a little bit about geology? Because when you talked about the pavilion and your first ideas had a lot to do also with geology. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, geology is, we, we have a relationship, I'm going to get a little bit esoteric, but we have a relationship to land um, that is very bodily. And I think at the moment with the crisis, we're all very aware of how, you know, how connected we are to each other and that we ingest we ingest each other, literally. You know, we have to be on the strict isolation and lockdown so that we don't, we, we cut off human connection between here and China or here in London or anywhere else. And I think in the same way, we are as connected to our land and our places of birth um, in that we, we, we breathe it in, we breathe in our atmospheres and they become a part of us. Um, and in Johannesburg in particular, in South Africa, um, the land question is of course a very big one because of all the disenfranchised um, peoples that we have who were removed from their land, but also because of the, the geology that we have of gold, um, which is also why Catherine's work is, is so pertinent for me and so inspiring as well, to think deeply about um, the, our forms of extraction and capitalism and so on that have very, very deep reaching consequences into the future that we don't see at the moment. And I think that this deep thinking, deep, uh, deep past and deep future is, is really necessary um, on every level. Um, in Joburg, it's also really interesting that the geology, and I think it's, this is true for all cities, but we have a really extreme example of it. The geologies are also used to separate people. So when cities are planned, um, who gets to live where, who gets to, who is living next to the most toxic areas, for example, versus nearer to clean air and so on is, is often very, very planned. In our city, people who live right next to toxic mine areas, mining wastes, um, are, are the poorest classes and who are suffering the most at the moment. Um, and I think, you know, it's, I, I don't want to sound dire, but the, but the issue of sustainability is really so connected to every aspect of our lives. And it's so important that we understand how interconnected all of these factors are so that when we intervene, 
um, it was purpose. There could not be a more wonderful conclusion, Sumaya. Thank you so, so much for this great conversation. Thanks again to Mike Bloomberg for the wonderful introduction, of course, to Bettina Korek for uh, her wonderful introduction. It's now the moment to open it up. I also wanted to thank Elena Foster uh, for her vision, because it's really in conversations with Elena that we develop this series. And uh, we're so excited to actually welcome in the next couple of weeks, David Ajay and also Jennifer Packer. Jennifer Packer, who is uh, in New York and will tell us about the exhibition, uh, which is gonna start in London uh, in September. And David Ajay, of course, will tell us about, the, from Ghana, about the amazing work he's doing there and which connects very much to many of the topics we've discussed today. So Sumaya, thank you so, so much. And I think we can open it up. And thank you all so much for joining. And I wonder if you have questions or comments, then we can take them now. <laughs>